Ted, thanks for joining uh, the Hockey News here for a little chat about uh, the, high, the business of hockey. Uh, thanks for uh, taking time out of your schedule to sit down with me. Uh, well, frankly, no, thank you. And uh, we've talked about this often. Every industry needs a leading light, independent editorial journal. Um, here in Washington, D.C., we had the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And it was really struggling. And Jeff Bezos um, came in and bought it and has invested in it and made the Washington Post great again. And, um, and you're kind of like the Jeff Bezos of the hockey world. So we wow. appreciate what you're doing and all the investment and how well you're curating this uh, very important publication. Well, thanks. It means a lot. That means a lot to me and means a lot to my, my team and everybody because, uh, you know, I, I had to, I'll, give you a, I'll give away something. I've been reading the hockey news for over half a century. You know, as a subscriber, you know, when I was a kid, I read it, and here we are, more than a half a century later, and, and I own it. But uh, it's—I uh, agree with you. It's a—it's an industry icon, and it needs to needs to grow. It needs to support uh, the, the the game that we both love, and that's yep. why we're here. And that's what we're doing here today is sort of expanding on that. Yep. Well, it's very exciting, and uh, your your publication—it's in the owner's box upstairs. It's become. Not has become, it's been the Bible for people who love the game and are in our industry. And so uh, let's get the show on the road. Well, I want to go back, if you don't mind, I want to go back to uh, 1987. 1987, and I would imagine that uh, that was the year I believe you got on your knee and you asked Lynn to uh, marry you. <laughs> Is that right? Is that what that uh, is? Yep, that's when we got engaged. And you gave her an engagement ring. I did. And you promised her like a Stanley Cup ring at some point. Uh, I didn't promise her that, oh. but I did have this list of 101 things to do before I die. Mm. And um, I had to share that with her before we got married to get her sign off on it because there were some random and goofy things on it, but one of them was own a sports team and win a championship. And um, she said, I love you, I'll be your partner, go for it. And she identified that winning a Stanley Cup on that list of 100 things was the, the thing that got her over the, you know, the uh, top, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there was, there's a whole bunch of things on the list, but uh, she knew my passion for, for sports, and it wasn't a... Um, uh, surprise um, when the Capitals came up for sale, several people, most uh, prominently Dick Patrick, reached out to me. And um, initially I, I said no. Um, my kids were very, very young. I was president of America Online. My hands were full. And I well, remember this vividly going home and my wife said, what's new? And I, I told her, and so what do you say? And I said, well, I passed a lot of scrutiny, a lot of time, effort, money, the kids, I passed. And right before we went to bed, she said, what if you get 99 of the 101 things to do before you die checked off, but you don't have the opportunity to buy a team or win a championship? And I said, well, that's why I love you. And <laughs> so next day I called Dick and, um, it's been 20 years. It's yeah. truly been a remarkable journey. And, you know, Dick Patrick has played a central part of that 20 years in my life. You know, if Dick doesn't make that call, is isn't persistent. And um, there was a stat last week that was amazing. Dick's been with the organization 37 years. Wow. And we have the most wins um, in the NHL during that 37 year span. And so, you know, I said, I want to win the Stanley Cup for our community and our fan base and our players and the entire organization. Uh, but I really want to win one for Dick because his family's played such a seminal role in hockey. And, um, you know, to see his name on the cup was very, very meaningful, as well as his son. So right. there's a lot of Patricks on that <laughs> Stanley Cup and in the Hall of Fame. Well, it took you 20 years, to, well, almost 20 years to get that. Most, as you know, most owners, they can own a team for five years, 10 years, long time. They never win a cup uh, at all. And you, you, you got it done. Uh, I know you had a window where you wanted to get it done, and you, you got it done. How, how has it changed I know it probably had a big impact on you personally because it's, it's a championship and the amount of time and energy you put into getting it. But how does it change the, um, you know, the business model of, of owning a franchise? What, what does it do differently for you? 
it's actually meant more for the community and our fans and frankly the people who have toiled in the organization for a long, long time. Um, the Stanley Cup is the hardest trophy to win in sports. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the Nationals were very close with uh, one of the, the main owner of the Nationals is one of our minority partners here at Monumental. They just won the World Series. Um, yeah, we, I'm, I'm from Montreal, by the way. Oh, and, there you go. And, well, thank you and, again. And I, Thanks I, for I, the <laughs> primary assist. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I was at the first ever Montreal Expo wow. game at Jerry Park. My dad, I have pictures of me in like little Expo uniforms. I still am upset that they've moved, but we won't, that's another interview some other time. Well, the World Series is... Um, is a very difficult trophy to win. Mm -hmm. um, um, they played three games back to back to back mm -hmm. um, and at home and they won and it was a big celebration. Um, to be sincere, the celebration when the Caps won was bigger. We, I joked and told Mark Lerner, well, we put our fans through more suffering. <laughs> it was a, a long time of coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, but people really appreciate the achievement because it's such a team game. Um, there's no one player, short of the goalie, I would say, um, who can just turn the series around. You can ride that one player. And um, they're wars. They're just seven-game series. And, and so there was this great emotional relief you know, I'm, I'm sad to say in, in a bit, half of my feelings were joy and half of my feelings were just pure relief because I didn't want to be the owner who we couldn't build a team during Alex Ovechkin's prime to win the Stanley Cup. I did not want that on want that our label. resume. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to be the most winningest franchise and sell out every game, but never having won a cup for, for the community. And, and the outpouring of, of joy and happiness that we saw in our city during the parade, to me was just, um, that's what I'll remember probably for the rest of my life, that that moment, and in a city where not a lot of people agree on a lot of things, Really? Yeah. <laughs> and to just see everyone of every color, every political background, all agreeing that this was a great experience and they were very, very, um, they shared in something that they'll remember for the rest of their lives. Yeah, it was unique to see, actually, to see how the baseball team and the hockey team sort of, you know, they were supporting each other uh, in this market. Oh, yes. Um, the highlight. There's, we're very, there were a lot of highlights, but when we won the Cup um, our first day back, we threw out the opening pitch. It was a 1 o'clock game. The team had to get there at 12. They probably rolled in at 11.30 a.m., and uh, it was quite the experience for them, and they went into the locker room with the whole Nationals team, and it was great. And then we had reciprocity. Um, their star pitcher... Max Scherzer, he would come when we were on the road and be with the 40, 50,000 people outside just hanging out. And when I spent some time with him, he said, I will do everything I can to replicate that experience for our fans. That was the greatest communal sharing of emotion and joy. And, and when they won the, uh, the World Series, he let it loose. <laughs> And uh, then they came here, and we continued the celebration. So it was just wonderful to see that. Uh, we own a WNBA team, mm -hmm. the Washington Mystics. We won a championship mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. um, we brought all of those players with the Caps. In fact, uh, Elena Deladon, our MVP player, she read out the starting lineup, which was really quite the, the experience. She dropped the puck. All of the players were here. And so... We're trying to build a community. Mm -hmm. um, our mayor now says that DC stands for District of Champions. <laughs> and we've put to bed this notion mm -hmm. that we're a second-rate sports town. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
And you know, I also own the Washington Wizards in the NBA, and all of our focus now is to make that team competitive. I mm -hmm. saw what Larry did in Toronto at the Raptors. Our organization looks very much like MSC Sports mm -hmm. in that we own the building, we own the hockey team, the basketball team, um, we own other sports, we own the WNBA team, we own the network, mm -hmm. and, um, and this is a endemic basketball town. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is to win a championship in every pro league that we compete in. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be the most socially responsible organization in our community. And uh, I think if we do that, we can build the most valuable um, establishment um, in all of sports. And that's a lofty goal, but that's what we have everyone try next. Well, on that, you know, I've spoken to a lot of owners around the NHL and other owners in, uh, in the NBA and um, league officials. And, um, you know, you sort of have the model. You have the perfect business model, really. Uh, from a business point of view, you have the facility, you have the teams, they all work together. You're just talking about how, you know, the basketball team works with the hockey team and vice versa. It, it's a nice, you know, uh, as opposed to an owner who just owns a team and they're renting in someone else's building, it's a different model. You have the, the perfect storm. Uh, and other teams and owners are looking at what you're doing and, and sort of following in your footsteps. You're, you're sort of blazing a trail. And on that, you know, you know, everyone's talking about esports now and, and the future of esports and how that impacts the engagement of the, uh, of the young, you know, the, the, the young person who maybe not, has not played hockey. And so I was talking to one other owner and they said, you know, if, if, I, can, if I can do and replicate what Ted's doing with esports, that'll really uh, catapult us to the next level. How, how important is esports? Well, I think it also is why hockey should be and continue to be ascendant mm -hmm. in that outdoor sports, uh, football, baseball, uh, they're, they're in the elements. It's very hard to have big screens. It's very hard to have high-speed cameras. It's very hard to have the fidelity of high-speed connectivity. Indoors, um, we just installed, you should take a look, 25,000 square feet of new pixels. Wow. We will have 5G in here soon. We want to, to celebrate speed. We want to celebrate real time. That's kind of what hockey is all about. Mm -hmm. Hockey is the game. When I first invested 20 years ago, I said video games are bigger than the movie industry, than Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And soon you'll be able to stream the games. And once you start to stream the game, you see it'll become global. And, and it'll be the biggest industry that we can imagine. And whenever you have a lot of people playing, mm -hmm. what will pop out is excellence, great players, and they'll become professionals. Mm -hmm. And so it took a long time for that to happen. But today, eSports is a phenomenon like you can't believe. And there are these publishers of the games who have created leagues. Mm -hmm. And so we, Peter Guber, who owns the Dodgers, the LA Dodgers in baseball and Golden State Warriors, he and I are friends, and we bought five years ago uh, the majority of Team Liquid. Yeah. And uh, we play on about a dozen platforms, and we have one of the best organizations in the world, certainly in North America, and we paid $15 million for the team. Forbes just did its list, says we're worth $320 million. But we win prize money in tournaments. I think we've won over $25 million of prize money for the players. And it's a different business model. It's a different audience. But that audience is very, very young and very, very hard to, to reach. And hard for us to give relevance to. And you know, my concern for us as sports team owners, I had this conversation yesterday uh, with someone from our, our network, uh, Comcast NBC Sports Washington. And I said, well, we're sold out for the caps. You cannot get a ticket. The only way you can get a ticket is in the secondary market. And mm -hmm. they mark that up sometimes two, three times. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a young person that goes to one of our eight universities, you love hockey, you graduate, 
you come into town, you rent an apartment, and you're making $60,000. You can't afford to get a ticket to go to the game, mm -hmm. and you're not getting cable. You're not signing up to cable. Right. So how am I going to make them a fan? And so we have to find new ways, new means of distribution, new types of content that gets to them. And it might be that an e-sport hockey, and the commissioner now has gotten religion, he really, really gets it and understands it. It's possible that e-sport and video game on a global basis is the way we grow the game and get people of interest because we forget sometimes in North America how diminished and small we are in the oval, old world census, right? There's 7 billion people on earth. Mm -hmm. It's 300 million, 350 million in America. What's there in Canada? 35. 35. So, so if combined we're... Sub 400. Sub 400 in a 7 billion. And of that 7 billion, 5 billion mm -hmm. are connected to high speed connectivity mm -hmm. and have devices. Mm -hmm. So I say we're less than 10% of the footprint. So, but everyone who's got an iPhone can get on Twitch, mm -hmm. can download a free game, can play Fortnite. And so my belief is that, that we have to embrace that. We have to have touch points for a young generation, introduce them to the game any way we can. Mm -hmm. And just like we joked and said your magazine has some events aside it, and one day it might be big events with the magazine aside it. Mm -hmm. It might be that the e-sport, the downloading of the software, the participation in community mm -hmm. is the NHL and the NBA's primary yep. business, mm -hmm. and it's all being used to drive people into the industry, into the building, or to watch something on on streaming well, makes, TV. That makes all the sense in the world because if you've got five billion people around the world, but think about it, you've only got 32 arenas holding 20,000 people at a time. So the reach obviously around the world, and let's face it, the, the, the 1.5 billion people in China are not gonna be going to NHL games. Uh, they might. Well, yeah, they yeah, might. I, I think um, we, 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 we've been leaders there. You know, Alex spent the summer, Alex Ovechkin mm. spent the summer there being the ambassador wow. in China. He came with his eyes open. I've spent a lot of time in my business career in China and the Olympics will be there mm -hmm. and and the government is very committed to fielding a competitive ice hockey mm -hmm. team for the Olympics. They're going to build arenas, they're going to need our coaches, they're going to mm -hmm. need people who know how to make good ice, mm -hmm. how to do training. And so my bet is that China, just like it is for the NBA, mm -hmm. it's a huge business. Mm -hmm. Small step back over the last 60 days mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. but overall, wow. it is a huge market. Do you see a lot of NHL teams? I know there's going to be some games over there. and so on. Do, you, do you see a time when there will be a, a team based in uh, Beijing? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, well, I think this KHL is there. Yeah. And why is that okay? Why did we, why did we let that happen? Mm -hmm. And we're all in the business to grow. Mm -hmm. And where will we have to grow? Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly, while Canada is our roots, mm -hmm. as you just said, there's 30 million people. Mm -hmm. And so it's curated, it, we pay homage to the history, we've expanded into North America, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I could see my grandchildren one day going to some kind of championship that's Europe and China and the US. I mean, that's, that's not a far-fetched idea. And I, I hope we want to do that mm -hmm. because the only two places that's growing right now is the digital transformation, digital social world mm -hmm. um, and China. Yeah. You know, um that takes me to the whole gaming. You would run from esports to sort of gaming, and I was out in Vegas and was learning a lot about gaming and what impact that's going to have on the league. How do you see how do you see gambling and gaming coming into not just hockey but in professional sure. sports? Period. Well, first you're in this big, beautiful building. Yeah. We spent forty million dollars last off season. We 
doing some rehabs and reinvesting in the building. The previous off season, we did over a hundred million. We pour money into this building and it's, it's an iconic building. It's one of the most important buildings. We have about 3 million people come in for all of our events mm. and we've got the dumbest business model in real estate I've ever seen. Mm. We own the building mm -hmm. and it shut down mm -hmm. until six o'clock on a game night. Right. You go to Las Vegas, yep. it's open 24 hours a day. There's no clocks. It's really bright. They're pumping in oxygen. The last thing they want you to do is leave the resort, the casino. You eat there, you're entertained there. Mm -hmm. What do we do mm -hmm. in pro hockey? We put a cage up yeah. to lock our fans out. We don't want you in. Six o'clock, the cage rolls out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thousand people go down visiting fans to watch some of our fans. Mm -hmm. Game ends. Yeah. We hustle people out. Push them out. We don't want you in no, here. Get out. Take your wallets with you. It's yeah. It's nuts, yeah. right? When you think no, about it. No. So we want to make the building alive, mm. and sports, gaming, and gambling will be soon legal here in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. And we want to be the first arena mm -hmm. that has a sports book right in the building. Mm -hmm. During the day, this is the most global of city, I can envision the World Bank, which is four blocks away, mm -hmm. 20 people from Australia who are here and coming and watching rugby and having lunch and placing a bet, which is second nature to them. Mm -hmm and it'll make our building come alive. Mm -hmm. um, I saw here when we were in the Stanley Cup final and on the road, mm -hmm. we opened the building and 20,000 people came and watched the game mm -hmm. in the arena mm -hmm. and outside, there were 50,000 people. <laughs> and it's, that was a wonderful community building experience, but they'll be able to do that and eat and gamble, uh, uh, right? right? right. And, and, it seems far-fetched for us, mm -hmm. but all you have to do is look to Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's on every, there are more William Hill and Ladbrook betting parlors in Britain mm -hmm. than there are Domino's pizzas <laughs> and Starbucks, right? right? I mean, it's, it's not a, it's a socially accepted mm -hmm. um, industry there. And, and my belief is that, and I, I, I say this and at first people get, I go, what are we afraid of? Mm -hmm. Like, like mm -hmm. we, it's not legal yet here. It's supposed to be for the beginning of the season. It, it'll probably, we'll do it next season. I go, okay, we'll be patient. We want this to be regulated the right way. Yeah. But do you think the Caps are in first place, best record in the NHL? The Nationals just won the World Series. The Mystics just won the WNBA championship. Mm -hmm. Do you think no one was gambling? We know there was $100 billion oh bet illegally mm -hmm. offshore in the bookies. No question. So all we did was empower mm -hmm. and activate more illegal gambling. Mm -hmm. Now, that it's illegal, that means you aren't paying taxes. There's no taxes. If you're a consumer, you're a criminal. If you're gambling, you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no jobs being created. Mm -hmm. There's no regulatory body on what are fair odds. Mm -hmm. There's no curation of, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. We're not going to accept your bet. Let us get you some help. Mm -hmm. There's nothing good that's happening on the dark web and mm -hmm. offshore. So I, I go, what, what are we afraid of? It's happening mm -hmm. and um, and you just look around the country there's 18 states now that have legalized it we know in Washington DC we have this great social responsibility to do it the right way mm -hmm. but if it can work here and it promises for the players for the union for the league another revenue stream mm -hmm. and more importantly the when you have skin in the game, when you're doing fantasy gaming, when you're gambling, you're watching the whole game. When you have 
prop bets. Mm -hmm. Every moment matters. Um, will, will there be, how many power plays will there be? Will Alex score on the power play? Um, will the game go to a shootout? Mm -hmm. what, what will the final score in the shootout be? These are all things that can happen once we put in 5G and we do real-time prop betting. Mm -hmm. Well, the television partners, they want that. that. That guarantees them much higher levels of engagement. Sure. So what do we want as a league? We want bigger deals from our media partners. Mm -hmm. If we get bigger deals, then the salary cap goes up, half the money goes back to the players in the union, and the pie expands. Mm -hmm. So, so I said, well, wouldn't you rather have the money go to the players and and to the owners who built the buildings and own the teams, than to the mafia. Absolutely, <laughs> right? to, exactly. So, so I, I hope in many of these things that pragmatism prevails. prevails mm -hmm. And I, I think it's going to happen much faster than we think, and we will be prepared and want to be a good exemplar leader here in Washington. Well, you know, let's let's take that and go to the, the next and last area I wanted to really sort of focus on. Um, the uh, the NHL owners, the executive committee of the owners, uh, this small group of owners that are really um, there from where I from where I sit to really be engaged with Gary on the immediate issues of the day, the big issues of the day, and to provide guidance. All these things we're talking about, we're talking about esports, we're talking about gambling, we're talking about uh, networks, and you, you know, you have this incredible network uh, relationship here. Everyone's talking about um, the next NBC or next television contract. I mean, it's coming in a couple of years, and everything seems to be headed towards that direction. And I, I, I've been sort of vocal that when that happens, Every NHL team will be worth a billion dollars, and every and the, the salary cap will go to a hundred million dollars. You know, it's because it raises all boats. So the owners in the smaller markets that are having uh, more difficulty uh, getting butts in the seats will now be able to benefit because this is going to be a big television contract, whether it's a television or a streaming. So the reason why I, I wanted to come and talk to you about this, uh, the main reason I wanted to come and talk to you about this, is because uh, at the executive committee of the board of governors. When I look at the resumes of the people that are on that executive committee, you're the clear front runner when it comes to technology, when it comes to, uh, because of AOL, you know, your deep background in that, your, uh, your experience with your own media company that broadcasts, uh, your esports history, and the fact that gaming is coming here. So when you're at the executive committee in your board meetings, and these are all issues that are on the table today and you're preparing to talk about uh, 2021, I think it is, is that the, the do you, do, are you taking a, a leadership role in that conversation at the executive committee? Um, the, the NHL is in very, very good leadership hands with uh, Gary Bettman and Bill Daly and the staff that they've created. Mm -hmm. the, the great thing about the NHL and about hockey, it's a team game. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the executive committee is very, very collaborative. And we weigh in on our areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, very, very experienced hockey people and they're very focused on how to make the game better. And I don't think the state of the game is any better than it is today. I mean, it's truly amazing how fast the game has become, how many new stars have entered the league. Um, it just it just seems right with the times, mm -hmm. and and so we we curate and make sure that we can make changes, but never get away from what makes hockey hockey great. From a business standpoint, Gary's done a really really good job. I mean, the deal that we did with Bam Tech um, built a lot of value for us. We were early on in OTT and direct to consumer. Uh, what the league is doing now. Mostly and more and more, we're all hopeful in partnership with the union and the players is to find next generation tournaments, next generation ways to expand and make the game more popular um, so we can sell tickets. Um, and then on the media front, we have a very, very valuable franchise. And, you know, one of the things that I've 
Donna, I'm very vocal on how sometimes we've undervalued our assets and our franchises. Mm -hmm. Like when you said, you know, one day teams will be worth a billion dollars. My no. team's worth a billion no, dollars I mean, right <laughs> now. And, that, and I think. Yeah. And, and, and in Toronto, obviously, it's worth, you know, more than a billion. But yeah. uh, the, you know, when you, when you look at uh, the average team valuation, there are some markets that it would be hard case to make that it's worth a yeah. billion dollars. And, and, but there, they need to connect with the younger people, the, the young people, it's so hard to reach. Mm -hmm. And we've got the game, the environment. You come into our arena, you come to a Caps game, you know, we played Monday night against Anaheim. Mm -hmm. Sold out, mm -hmm. rocking and rolling, some justice on both sides, <laughs> trying to be meted out. And, and I, I had some guests, and it was like, I had no idea this is what, this had turned into. We got sky ring videos. It's it just it just looks like it's made for the digital world. Right. And and so if we can maintain that relevance mm -hmm. and the people that we attract mm -hmm. are educated, passionate, they're so loyal to the teams. I mean it, it's truly amazing. You look out in the arena on a Monday night and everyone's wearing a red jersey. Yeah. I go, that means that somebody is head of the Department of Interior in Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah. And he said, oh, I'm going to the game tonight. I'm bringing yeah. my jersey, yeah. right? Yep. And, and you can't find that kind of, um, I want to badge myself. I want to be connected and look like I'm a part of this community, and they they share in all of the quirky little things that are endemic to our community. And so I think the media partners will value what we're doing greatly, but I also mm -hmm. think it's the next generation of media mm -hmm. partners. That well, let me, let me go back, because first of all, I've been on the record I, uh, about uh, what Gary and his team have done uh, from a business point of view. They've knocked it out of the park for using a baseball. Yes, the, but on the on the on the owner's side, uh, you know, you know, like you said, it's a team, and the executive is a team. But every team needs a captain. There's not a single team out there that doesn't have a captain of the team. And it seems to me that at going into this next generation, talking about esports, talking about connectivity, talking about digital, to me, there's nobody, there's no other owner in the league, and I can say that there's no other owner in the league that is more digitally has more digital DNA than you. Do you feel that uh, when you're in these meetings and you're talking about the future, do you feel like there's a certain amount of other owners that are looking to you for sort of the, I'm not talking about the Gary side, I'm talking about the owner side. Yeah, well, I have lots of friends and we back channel, and we talk to each other, we try to share best practices. Mm -hmm. When we announced our deal with William Hill, a lot of people calling, how did you do that? What did you do? We did our deal. Uh, in China, we, we have a lot of Chinese advertisers in the building. How did you structure that? Um, what we've done with our own OTT network. I mean, right now in Denver, there's an issue where, where Colorado Avalanche are not showing up on their cable network. I was fearful that that could happen to us in DC. So we launched an OTT network mostly to get new fans, but in case we couldn't reach an agreement, mm -hmm. we had a platform to put our games on to be able to stream. Mm -hmm. And we had successful relationship with NBC Sports Washington, and we ended up with a great deal, and we own 33% of our regional sports network. Mm -hmm. They liked what we were doing in OTT, and they said, well, we'll invest, and we'll own 33% of your network. And now we've got this first of kind, very copacetic, very synergistic set of relationships. Mm -hmm. And it is a really, really good model. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we, I encourage errors of commission. I don't like errors of omission. And let's try lots of new things. Not everything's gonna work, but as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. we only need one that <laughs> Facebook, we yeah. only need one that's Google. Yeah. And what are we afraid of, right? And mm -hmm. I think what happens a lot, especially now, is that you're afraid of what I call shame pixels, right? Um, if you're 
if you're failing, the media, the bloggers, everyone's going to say, aha, yeah. I told you. Yeah. And I go, well, you know, what did Wayne Gretzky say? Yeah. You don't score on 100% of the shots Sometimes you don't, don't take, take, right? I mean, I, I look at Alex that way. Alex leads the league every year in shots on goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a reason that he scores a lot of goals. <laughs> he takes a lot of shots. So yeah. that is a great cultural thing for us. We shouldn't be afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. We should, because we're the, the hungrier sport. And, and it's interesting, we're, we're the, we have the most longevity, mm -hmm. but I look at us still as a startup, right? We should not be, in fact, the capitals are looked at as by, by some of our friends in Canada. Jeff Molson was here, attended uh, the game the other day where they beat us. And, um, you know, Montreal, it's, you know, the Citadel. And it's like, no, no, Toronto is. And we're looked as newbies, and we're you know forty five years old. You're young, yeah, you're a kid, right? Yeah. And and so so I want to have that startup mentality, that no fear mentality. And on occasion, we do something wrong, we deserve to be slapped, right? We something's not working. I encourage people to say, "Hey, we tried. Right. It didn't work. Next slide. Let's go on to the next thing." And. And so, and, and I believe that our fans relate to that. We listen to them, I read their email, I read their comments, I wander around the building all the time and talk to people. And that is such a healthy way to sense and respond. And I think that's where, and, and Gary, I give credit to, we joke, um, I'll send Gary an email or a text and sometimes I feel like it's just gone, whoosh, yeah. and I get a response. I know. Yeah. And he's become very sense and respond. He's very communicative to the other owners. Mm -hmm. He's not paranoid about owners talking to other owners. Mm -hmm. And we have a very, very healthy environment, ownership, the league management, Gary, with our communities. And, you know, I'm just hopeful that we can continue to grow. And as I've, you know, always said, when, when you start a high-tech company, your, your employees are your partners. They have equity in the team and the like. And, and I say to the players all the time, we're partners. We're not adversaries. Mm -hmm. um, we give you 50%, right? Yeah. And, and we, mm -hmm. we want to work with the union. We want to work with the league. We want to work with the players because the more that pie grows, mm -hmm. the better for it. There's nothing bad that comes out of growth. No. And the only way that I know that you grow is you have to innovate. You have to experiment. You have to be able to try and test lots of things. And when something really works, then you go really, really hard at it. Well, you, you, you said, like, I've been playing hockey since the age of, like we've got pictures of me like two and three years old on the ice with a stick. So I've been playing. You own some stick companies, I own a, right? I own a bunch of hockey stick companies and different things. But uh, you know, uh, I've tried twice now to, to label you as the captain of the executive committee. I, and I, you know, and you, hockey's and, a, and, uh, and you, it's you play yeah, for the symbol yeah, and yeah. the badge so in you're front. A, you're a typical hockey player. You're just humble. You won't take the your team. It's team. You deflect. You deflect. So you are a well, hockey I'm player. Well, fl I'm flattered. I do, I do mm -hmm. respect all the fellow owners, mm -hmm. even though I want to beat their <laughs> but every time sure. that we play, that that's the other thing about sports that people don't understand. Pro mm -hmm. sports, mm -hmm. uh, we're like brothers in the boardroom, and we collaborate and we talk. But then we play a game, and I <laughs> we want to like kill each other. Yeah, that's difficult. Right? Yeah, no, I, I see that in the com the competitiveness of a of a Craig Leopold when he's at a game. You know, he has a suite and he has a row of his seats there, and everybody knows. Do not even talk to him. You know, even if the, even he's up six yeah. to nothing, don't talk to him. You know? Well, Craig's a great man, great family. Craig's son uh, interned here. He went to a local university. We hired him, and um, and now I think he's back working with the family company. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean. It's you you form really good relationships, yeah. really bonding. Yeah. But when we play as team, yeah. I'll be screaming at him. <laughs> that guy's yeah. such a bad player. He's so dirty, you know? <laughs> Dad, thanks a for good your man. time. Thank Appreciate you so much. Thanks.